Well, I'm delighted to welcome you uh, all to the second Celebrating Our Associate Professors event of the spring semester. I'm sorry I'm not able to uh, be there in person uh, with you today, uh, but I'm really happy uh, to introduce this session today to celebrate three outstanding colleagues, Ramses Martinez, Danny Yu, and Lutian Do. Um, the purpose of these, these events is pretty straightforward. There are three, three principal purposes. The first is really to celebrate the success of these colleagues. It's not been an easy journey for them. And uh, they have done some remarkable, amazing things. And so present in the audience today are uh, some of the mentors of these colleagues, um, some of the staff who have helped and worked with them, uh, and some close colleagues uh, who have been invested in their success. And we're all here to celebrate that success. A second is uh, also very straightforward. We'd like uh, the, the colleagues here to share uh, some of the seeds of their success. That's why we have some PhD students in the audience, uh, some postdocs in the audience as well, uh, and perhaps other assistant professors who could be uh, looking uh, to replicate the success in the future. And so we'd like to learn about what key decisions uh, did these colleagues take that helped them be successful uh, as they are. Um, and lastly, we hope that this meeting leads to collaborations. We have a lot of colleagues from different departments um, in the room right now. And we have noticed that many of these meetings um, often is the first time that another colleague even hears about uh, the great work being carried out by uh, the colleagues that we're celebrating today. So it's a great chance to collaborate as well. And uh, to introduce uh, our first speaker today, uh, I'd like to invite uh, our head of industrial engineering, uh, Young Jen Sun. Over to you, Sun. Thank you, Arvin. Uh, good morning. My name is Young Jun Son. I'm the school head of industrial engineering. Uh, since I joined on June 1st this year, I'm very new, I've been uh, truly enjoying learning uh, those new programs that are unique to uh, Purdue and uh, celebrating associated professors event. This event is indeed actually one of them, okay? So today I'm here to uh, introduce two outstanding professors of uh, IE. So first, the uh, Professor Ramses Martinez. So Dr. Martinez is currently associate professor in industrial engineering, as well as the Weldon School of uh, Biomedical Engineering. Dr. Martinez joined the Purdue in January 2015 uh, after completing his PhD in Physics and Material Science at MIT and the uh, Spanish National Research Council in 19, uh, 2009 and serving in postdoctoral scholar and research associate position at Harvard University. So Dr. Martinez's work focuses on exploiting new manufacturing technologies and uh, understanding the design, interfacial, and the uh, physiochemical principles underlying development of the flexible electronics, soft robotics, and optical devices to improve human well-being. He has uh, specifically contributed to the areas of the scalable and cost-effective manufacturing of flexible electronics and optical devices uh, for hum uh, health monitoring and soft robotics for novel applications, such as skin-aware wearable and implementable electronics, smart clothes, and wearable sensors for point-of-care diagnosis. He had a strong record of the scholarly publications, which include over 50 journal papers, and uh, uh, impressive portfolio of over 13 uh, patents. Dr. Martinez uh, received uh, several awards, including Teaching for Tomorrow Award, College of Engineering Faculty Award for Excellence, and the 2018 Global Faculty Award, and a last year NSF Career Award. Let's welcome Dr. Martinez. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. OK, so uh, this presentation here starts with, uh, you have heard a lot about me and all the things that I've studied, but uh, kind of like uh, to give you the background, 
I'm originally from Madrid, Spain. Uh, Madrid is a wonderful place. Uh, like uh, I, I actually like owe a lot like my parents to to grow me in such a like a vibrant environment. And uh, and even though they have like wonderful parties, as you can tell, uh, I was able to actually study. And I was it was I was the first one in my family who made it to the university. Uh, I studied physics. And uh, this happened because uh, my grandpa was uh, a person with very solid, um, solid standards, and he thought that like uh, um, there were only two things that you needed to do in order to get a good education, and that was like knowing how to play chess, and the other one was knowing fencing, okay, because you needed to defend yourself. So the, I found that a little medieval. Of course, he, he would like say like of, I, I needed to read Kant and Nietzsche, which by the way is not something that I would recommend to any like um, high schooler. It's it, it's not a happy reading. So, uh, but anyway, so I, I just grew with that and uh, basically with the with the passion of. Uh, getting mesmerized by systems and getting to uh, tear apart my toys and, uh, and to be able how to, uh, or, or to think how to, how to play with the components and how to make new toys uh, with different parts of, uh, of, of, of previous ones. Um, also, in Spain, uh, pranks are like a, quite a, like of a daily basis thing. So I, I actually was able to modulate my voice a lot. But uh, unfortunately for me, even though it was a lot of fun, uh, like these uh, phone pranks from pay phones is something that died in the 90s. But uh, uh, anyway, so I just uh, took my superpower and became a voice actor and uh, put the, my voice to like several um, uh, GPS systems, uh, the Pinsular uh, Castilian Spanish course, and uh, several other things. So, all right. So now, what is uh, what actually was motivating me? Like uh, after I got my uh, PhD and I knew a lot about like different characterization techniques, different materials. Uh, well, uh, it was actually the first time after I finished, uh, like uh, when I was finishing my PhD, that I arrived to the U.S. and. Uh, and even though like life here and in Europe, like it's actually more or less the same, uh, the, something that this sounds out like very clearly is that like this is a wonderful country, so far you don't get sick. And, um, and well, just like uh, knowing how expensive it gets when compared with other countries, um, basically I started like uh, while doing my postdoc at Harvard of thinking like, okay, what is gonna happen to people that actually do not have that kind of money? And, uh, and over here, you can tell like there are like many places like uh, hospitals in Tanzania that uh, they don't even have individual rooms. Basically, like uh, you just have like some beds, you fill them up, and at some point, like uh, you're gonna have to cluster people in the middle, and uh, like the attention that you will get from the doctor will come whenever it comes, okay? And you better make it. So uh, that makes like uh, over uh, five million children every year under the, in the age of five to die by preventable causes, which I believe is, is a terribly uh, sad uh, experience. Anyway, so here is my, uh, um, when, when I was at Harvard again, I knew a lot about them, like molecules. So I came to the, um, uh, to the idea of like, okay, can we just take simple paper and uh, run uh, chemical or diagnostics using simple paper pieces so that like uh, the current lab testings can be just performed at home and for a minimal amount of money. So the first thing that you know is that paper actually becomes, uh, is, it soaks very easily. These two pieces of paper are part, from the, like, uh, part of the same original piece. So we treated one with uh, fluorinated molecules that like, basically um, makes it like uh, omniphobic, both oleophobic and hydrophobic. And, uh, and with that, we thought like, okay, so is this something that can actually withstand uh, dealing with blood, which is a complex system that has fat and like uh, salts and, and other things. And uh, as you can tell, like the drop of blood is actually uh, rolling down like quite spherically. So that means that we are not leaving traces behind and that now thanks to this uh, treatment, we were able to change the properties of the paper. Then we thought like, okay, why don't we do some origami? And uh, over here you have a, a plate which is used for like pipetting multiple samples and it is made of paper. It can withstand like, a, like multiple months of, a, of like a, under the sun. It will not, pre it will not lose its uh, capabilities. It feels uh, light. And uh, if you touch it, you will not distinguish it from like regular paper. And after you're done, you can just simply burn it and that's all. 
And then we thought like, okay, so what about like more complex tests? And, uh, and by stacking layers of paper, uh, because it's very thin, uh, well, we thought like uh, this is actually quite an easy way of like actually running several tests or like several processes inside a simple paper chip. And uh, we, could, like, we could do serial dilutions and we were able actually to replicate many of the steps that are necessary to be performed in a lab otherwise. So when I arrived to Purdue, this idea of uh, taking a molecule and using it to change the, the properties of, uh, of, of a substrate was something that was actually like, a, like something that I really wanted to implement into, into a large scale so that we were able to fabricate systems that will be able to, to give this um, at home capability of doing self-diagnostics properly. So then what, I, what we thought is like, okay, so we have a system, uh, we, it is uh, completely omniphobic, so it will not react to water unless like, it is on the, only on, on the regions that we want it. Uh, but is this, um, what is preventing diagnostics from going one step further? And then we, like, basically it was quite obvious that we needed a source of power. And uh, the very first thing that you do when you need more power is like uh, saying like, okay, what are the things that I can just basically get rid of? And then you transform your benchtop electronics into something that is like two by two centimeters. But uh, shrinking uh, is not always the answer. And, uh, and then we thought like, okay, so since we are using molecules, why don't we change these molecules so that they can take energy from the tip of our fingers when we are tapping them? And then we, did, we designed like this system here at Purdue where uh, basically you can, the user can simply tap the interface or the, of this testing device, put the drop of, of blood, and then the little electronics will be able to take the power and actually perform the uh, the, the, um, the electronic based testing um, is an electrochemical testing that will give you a final diagnostic. Uh, then, uh, okay, so paper happens to be like uh, quite thin, uh, it is easy to manufacture on large scale. Can we make this real again on a large scale? Can we make like some electronics like uh, that you can put on top of your skin? Because there are many stickers out there. Can, can we make such a thing? And then uh, basically it was a combination of like uh, changing, like rather than putting a little drop of molecules on top of the paper as we did at the beginning, we thought like, okay, why don't we just simply spray? And then we spray the, uh, these molecules that change the character of the paper. Then we spray conductive uh, nanoparticles. And then with the laser cutter, we trim these serpentine designs that can be easily attached to the skin. And if the paper is thin enough, as the cigarette paper, for example, then like, you can just simply uh, use this as an antenna to read information from the, uh, from, uh, from the outside. Or uh, you can mount it on the skin. And, uh, and it will conform nicely. That means like, uh, again, this is like uh, just a sticker, you put it on top of your skin, and the white tape that you're seeing is actually water soluble. So in the moment that my student started squirting water, water on top, uh, you will see how it actually fades away. And uh, after it dissolves, the system becomes perfectly, uh, perfectly attached to the skin, and it can stay there without you noticing or getting the user to be uh, limited in terms of like the natural motions. So, all right, so that is when it is dry, and again, it conforms beautifully the skin, and it doesn't break. So uh, you can also implant it because uh, the paper we are using was biocompatible, uh, basically using natural fibers. And uh, this uh, little mouse over here in a collaboration with the, um, uh, with the School of Animal Science uh, was able to actually get the radiation in order to prevent uh, sarcomas from uh, coming back to life again. Uh, these stickers can be placed anywhere in the body. So we can put them near the eyes to check on the, um, on the uh, pace at which uh, pilots are actually blinking, uh, how they activate their muscles, and how their heart works. And again, uh, just putting them closer to a lighter will just basically get, in, get in them to, to ignite, burn, and, um, and, it will be, and it will be just like uh, reduced to nothing and generate minimal byproducts. Of course, because I'm a hacker and I like to hack things, I thought like, okay, where, where can we put this technology? So we decided to just like uh, create these electronics and embed them into conventional uh, bandages. 
So we put them inside bandages, and uh, it changed our electronics so that the uh, kids from the children uh, hospital uh, will not be uh, like very negative about like wearing this. So uh, we made it into a smiley face uh, and made it like uh, so it will have a connectivity with uh, with the cell phone, and uh, we were able to measure like a variety of things. And then is when uh, basically this came up to us like uh, actually. Uh, paper is very similar to wood, it's just like simply thinner uh, if you look at it under the microscope and it is also very similar to cotton fibers. So that means like uh, most of the textiles that we actually wear are susceptible to be functionalized or to be changed in their characteristics using the molecules that we use. So why not doing such a thing? And uh, we were able actually to embroil different functional systems that can be actually grabbing energy from every time the user steps on the floor, every time the user uh, like frictions like the lateral side of their uh, clothes while walking, or even every time they are flexing their elbow. So. Uh, we can use that to charge capacitors and uh, actually this technology it is completely uh, something that you can squirt capture on top of it and like you can clean it right away after which makes these textiles both breathable and also something that you don't have to w care very much about like uh, keeping them clean. I'm gonna show you this video over here from uh, from uh, one of the students, and um, ah, this, is, this is the only video that actually has uh, music, and the music is actually playing and stopping as uh, the student constro controls it like with the, with the textile. So right now textiles uh, are now starting to become an interface that the user will use to communicate with the machines nearby. And we really hope like, uh, the, like, to collaborate towards changing this uh, way of thinking about like cyber physical systems. All right, so the last thing that we said is like, okay, so why don't we just make our own thread? And uh, we did that using silk and combining that with, uh, with carbon. And this, uh, these coils that we are able to, like uh, basically that we can just sew, uh, are actually capable of getting energy from the uh, wirelessly. Uh, basically anywhere where you have internet, there is energy uh, that is floating around and these uh, devices can actually harvest that energy and, uh, and still uh, work beautifully underwater because the molecules dislike water so much that they generate a layer of, uh, a layer of air on top that is preventing the water to get in contact with the electronics. And again, just like uh, shaking it a little bit or just like touching it with a paper towel will be enough to get this system completely uh, clean and ready to go. And finally, uh, I, want you to, uh, I want you to see like uh, this uh, final invention that which was like, okay, if we have textiles that can react and uh, with other machines, can textiles be something that will tell us if we are about to do something dangerous and prevent that uh, possible damage from happening? So we made this uh, glove, which is actually capable of detecting if the, if the, if a life, uh, sorry, is if a wire is, is live or not. So at the beginning, the, the wire is basically um, disconnected, but as soon as it is connected and the finger gets uh, nearby the, the cable, uh, the LED lights on, and, uh, and that will tell any electrician which one is the cable that they can touch and where they need to be extra careful. So again, uh, what I think about the future of uh, wearables is uh, I believe they are the best interface for us to interface with other machines and also uh, with ourselves. They are going to be constantly checking on our wealth. Uh, on our wealth. Uh, they are going to be checking if, uh, if we are healthy, if our signals decay with time, and they are going to be coupled uh, with uh, machine learning methods that will be uh, making artificial intelligence to better understand users and uh, also to better understand how uh, different diseases evolve in the long term. So I uh, want to thank, uh, like especially to my mentors here, people who have helped me during the hard times, like uh, during this the tenure process, Dr. Moller, uh, Professor Raman has uh, been very helpful, uh, Professor Chandra Sekar in industrial engineering, um, and uh, my advisors, uh, Professor Whitesides and Professor Garcia. And uh, my department, 
who has supported me a lot, like uh, helping me with my TAs and, uh, and providing me the capability to develop the courses that I love to teach. And that is why I can actually uh, teach my students how to hack different uh, uh, elements so they can transform and expand their functionality on my course on, electro uh, on electromechanical systems. And I can introduce them to the beauty of robotics and the beauty of like uh, interfacing with humans. And uh, I also want to thank my, my collaborators in Animal Science and the School of uh, Medicine of Indiana University and uh, my long list of uh, students uh, who made this possible. Of course, uh, like a uh, part of uh, this support comes from my wife and my son Alex and, uh, and with that I, I also want to thank you all for your attention. Really appreciate it. Great job. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. Hi. Uh, so at the end of the checkout lane, the common question is plastic or paper? And so I have a... Yeah, I know it's on, but it was... Um, so do you have an idea of, in terms of sustainability and not creating more gadgets that accumulate in landfills, do you prefer making them on paper or polymers, or what do you think? In terms of lifetime and sustainability. Very good. So... Uh, I am very fond of fibrous structures because they are breathable. And uh, because if you put a sticker on your, uh, on, on your skin and you leave it there for a week, uh, after you peel it, it will look reddish ready underneath. And there are people that are allergic and have actually like a problem sweating and other, other complications. So uh, paper becomes a very good alternative for, th for this purpose. There are some polymers that are even cheaper than paper. So maybe there is uh, somewhere in between. And that is also why like, my group is now working on the development of uh, new microfibers that we create on the spot and we can control the breathability of the system and also the mechanical properties better than we can with uh, conventional paper that we just, just bought. So, thank you. Uh, congratulations uh, from uh, BME side as well. Um, thank so you I very much. I see your research is more aligned to BME than IE. So when are you come to BME and stay in BME? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question indeed. So um, yeah, so I, I, I actually love like uh, BME motivation and, uh, and to basically think of, uh, think of uh, Think of like saying, okay, I might be putting a lot of hours on this project, but this might potentially help somebody. And that is a powerful, like, a, it's, a, it's a very powerful driving force. And uh, I'm very happy to couple it with uh, the fact that industrial engineering is very interested in rethinking manufacturing and, uh, and making sure that the scalable manufacturing, manufacturing is actually uh, meaningful and that we are actually transforming, like, a, like for example, our healthcare accordingly. Thank you. Uh, nice talk. Uh, so I'm wondering for your device, for the you can make flexible circuit uh, like uh, wires, right? But for the electronic component like LEDs and the logic computing thing, are you still using silicon or C5, or are you using like soft materials, organic? Or Very good question. So there are uh, there are significant uh, advances right now in the area of like uh, material science to change the. Um, uh, to, to create new materials that can be actually printed and have some properties like, uh, like transistors and so forth. And some of them have very good biodegradability, which is, uh, in my opinion, the future. For some of these uh, proof of concept, we have a stick, however, to uh, conventional electronics. However, to make it like a fully flexible, we couple it with um, uh, we, we take two approaches. One, basically we put everything together and then we reuse that system, so only we change the bandage and uh, that is actually nice because you can keep this clean all the time and just like uh, throwing away the paper part. And the other one is to basically distribute the electronics so that they are farther away from each other and then you get a distributed circuit that is flexible and mechanically comfortable. We have a question from the online. Oh, please. Dr. Yee's online and says, thanks for sharing your work. It's fascinating. 
have you pursued commercializing those technologies? Uh, I'm very glad uh, to have, uh, I mean, one of the very good things of being at Purdue is that we have the Purdue Research Foundation, which provides us with a lot of support to patent our technology and to uh, find potential, um, uh, potential investors and companies that might be interested in, uh, in what we produce. So we are currently, for example, uh, exploring a contract that we have with a company to, to generate wearable devices. For, uh, this is for athletes that want to get the best out of their workout, and the best way to do so is to actually generate, um, uh, to receive a very nice panel of information of their performance on, on their cell phone. So they can compare and check like what happens when they change their diet and uh, what happens when they change their routines. So, I have a question on the really important area of industrial engineering and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're developing these digital twins, as you probably are sort of right? And so one of the core challenges there is how can you develop digital twins of workers more easily? And it seems to me that the, the data you are... Oh, sorry. Yeah, it should be up. It's on. Yeah. It's on. Okay. Thank you. Can you, you want me to start again? Yes. yes. Okay. So first of all, thank you for staying in industrial engineering because we have great problems thank you. for you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the question is, digital twins are really sort of like one of the grand challenges in manufacturing right now. And so the idea is sort of have models being fed by real-time data that you could generate with your wearable mm -hmm. sensors. Have you thought about that and how that could improve sort of like the life of workers, uh, competitiveness of manufacturing and so forth? I think it's a very challenging problem. It is indeed. And uh, one of the lines uh, of research that we currently have alive is, uh, is basically on tiny artificial intelligence. Uh, so because it's very um, computer expensive uh, like to actually run these uh, like machine learning algorithms uh, there is like some like tiny uh, machine learning that can be done like uh, on the edge and we are actually applying that to our system so that they can generate the information and actually filter which one is the information that is relevant for example towards the elaboration of a of a digital twin Excellent. so very good okay we have a last two <coughs> questions yes um, yeah, I was just wondering for like the wearable mm -hmm. electronics, like the ones that were on um, clothing, could you put that in like a conventional washing machine or something like that? Or do you have to like hand wash or how does that work? That's a very good question. And it was something that took us a significant amount of research. So uh, one of the things and the reason why you see this little kitty over here is that if you create a functional um, tapping clothes, the problem is that you don't know where to tap. And actually, that is the most useful part of the calculator, right? Like knowing where you have the each of the numbers so you can actually do or get the functionality. So we did like some embroidery for, for that to happen. And uh, now, when we were actually doing the embroidery, we faced this issue of like getting chipping when we were uh, trying to clean this after. After many cleans, like even though like this one cleans very nicely, it, like it was chipping away the electronics inside and the, and the performance was decaying. So we changed the recipe and uh, we actually added that, um, another molecule that adds and that acts as an adhesive uh, with the metallic particles. So now these ones do not detach and then there is another particle that actually coats everything nicely. So uh, with these electronics, after they were optimized, we were able to uh, throw or to basically to, to throw these uh, smart cloths into the washing machine and uh, do the uh, testing basically the, the normalized testing for laundry, which is uh, 50 loads at uh, like uh, whatever is normal in your washing machine. So yes, you can wash them like 50 times and they will not lose their properties after they have been optimized. Thank you. Okay, so congratulations, Ramses, again. Let's keep a big round of Thank applause for this continuous success. Thank you.